All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. I think I speak for the entire panel when I say we are very excited to be here with this topic on the Ricina stage. Um, thanks to, to ORF for, for, for giving us this platform. And also, obviously, for all, all of you in the audience. Uh, I think our goal in the spirit of the topic, which is very much about inclusivity, will also be to really have a discussion with the audience. Um, so, you know, obviously, we have a lot of expertise and, and experience on the panel, but we will definitely also open it up uh, to your, your questions. So what we will talk about uh, today is the buzzword of a feminist foreign policy. Not everyone who implements parts of it, who is concerned with gender equality, calls it a feminist foreign policy, and there's still very much a debate about what it actually means. So I think it will be a great contribution if we go out here with you know, some diverse insights into you know, what it could mean in, in different uh, contexts and how we can make sure it can be implemented and we can also, as it says in, in the program that was put together by the organizers of the conference, um, really raise a generation of, of uh, proponents and also allies for uh, the cause of, of inclusivity. We will uh, start with Ambika, who is here uh, to my right, um, who will also introduce a publication that is uh, on all of your tables and get us uh, started with, with her view on what a feminist foreign policy is and how that is reflected in her recent work on the Indian context. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you to the ORF again for putting this panel together. Last year, Samir asked me to moderate a panel on a new form of multilateralism, looking at it from a feminist lens, and that panel went off really well. It received a lot of attention. And uh, so I'd like to say that contributed a little bit to this panel coming together as well. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm going to start by introducing this report. It's there on everybody's table, and there are extra copies as well. I'm very pleased to actually publicly announce this report for the first time, um, Opportunities for a More Inclusive Indian Foreign Policy. This report has been put together by my company, uh, the Cooper 9 Initiative, and the Conrad R. Nauer Stiftung India office. Uh, what we did for the last couple of years was first understand and try and unpack for an Indian audience what the feminist foreign policy conversation was in, that was happening in Europe and in parts of North America, uh, well, in Canada and in Mexico more specifically. What we realized, and I think this is really important, was that some of this was rooted in that transatlantic space and came out of the lived experiences of many of these countries. They had different visions of where they saw this movement going. And I'm not going to talk so much about that because I think uh, Hans might be able to offer a little bit from the Sweden perspective. But Sweden is in 2004 is where this movement began. And uh, it caught on to a few other countries around that part of the world. But what did it mean and what does it really mean for a country like India or others that might want to get on to this um, movement, so to speak, and join that conversation. And so that's what we try to understand. And so we spent a whole year just talking to everybody in every single FFP country. And I say FFP because it uh, helps me shorten that time a little bit. Uh, what we realized amongst many things was that A, it was rooted in their understanding of what they saw a feminist foreign policy might be, but it also came from their experiences. and. What we then try to do is put India's experiences in that conversation to say that if this idea and this ideal of a different kind of governance, a different kind of diplomacy and engagement and global system going forward was going to be developed, it needed to be truly inclusive in that it included everybody around the world. So it couldn't be a feminist foreign policy that came out of a select group of countries, um, which is also a kind of conversation we're having on many other issues today around the world. And so we unpacked that conversation for an Indian audience, but then we also tried to unpack what was happening in India for the global audience, uh, which was we realized was necessary because this question kept coming up as to what we in India thought a feminist foreign policy could look like. And so this report is then a culmination of all of that research as to what the Indian audience understood 
of that conversation. Uh, as some of you might imagine, the word feminist uh, incites, it excites, and it alarms also a little bit everybody. And so we, we try to look at feminism from an Indian lens, but we also said it has to be inclusive. And so that's why our report is an inclusive Indian foreign policy, because we try to say that Feminist foreign policy, while it inclusivity, intersectionality is at the very core of all of it, what does it mean when you, s when you bring in a country like India or any other South Asian country that might want to join this conversation, when you bring in a country like Australia that's also thinking about it from its indigenous pop population perspective, or if you bring in other African countries that have different considerations. So that question of inclusivity then becomes really important. Uh, it's, yes, it's about gender, it's about rights, representation, it's about power, but it's also about other communities that uh, a lot of foreign policies might uh, affect or um, uh, be ge geared towards. It's about uh, your ethnic minorities, it's about different groups, it's about caste, class, religion, uh, migrants, what, whatever might be more important for that particular country. And so that's why we took that broader lens, so to speak, to say that in India, all of these considerations are important along with that conversation of gender. Um, and so all of that's in the report. I'll, uh, I'll stop for now, uh, and uh, we can come back to more questions if they're on the report or on our research, if anybody might have any. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much, Ambika, and, and I think you already touched uh, up on, a, on a range of important points, uh, notably that at the origin of feminist foreign policy is really the thought of inclusivity and not just promoting women, right? Not, ha not just having a few check boxes where you say, okay, uh, we thought about this and we have one woman at the table at it so that no one uh, you know, makes a fuss on Twitter that we're organizing a manual. That in itself, of course, uh, you know, is not all of, of what's in the concept. And, and so the intersectional part, really having, having uh, uh, other marginalized community also regarded um, is really seen in this discourse as the power. Um, of the concept, and I think uh, you know your report and also the Indian conversation will really be an important addition to to the global conversation on what a feminist, uh, truly feminist foreign policy is. I would uh, like to continue now with Nancy. Uh, Nancy, here on the panel, uh, you are based in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, and in the private sector. We talked a little bit ahead of this panel uh, about the fact that the U.S. does not, you know, have an explicit feminist foreign policy, doesn't call it that, but obviously uh, is also concerned with, you know, a g a gender uh, as a topic and, and inclusivity. And we would be curious to hear what, what you think, what a feminist foreign policy is, and also you in the private sector and in cooperation with governments. Um, yeah, your view on it. Great, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation. And I'm, I'm honored to be on a, a panel with such distinguished panelists. Um, and you're right, a feminist foreign policy uh, made me pause because it's not a term that we, we regularly use in the United States. Um, I would say that in the United States, we have been on a journey for women's rights, um, human rights for, for quite a long time. And I can speak to my role at Lockheed Martin where I interface regularly with uh, U.S. government and the foreign diplomatic community, as well as visiting foreign officials, um, and, and then give a little bit about our industry perspective and the role that industry plays, because I think there are analogies between the quest for uh, representation um, in foreign policy and security and in private industry. So I'll, I'll start by saying that um, leadership is absolutely critical. There is a political will and a leadership imperative um, driving uh, diversity and inclusion, which is how we're now talking about it in the United States. Um, <clears throat> I would say in addition to the, the political and leadership um, imperative, um, there is an economic imperative to having diversity and inclusion be part of uh, our business ethics, our business values. As a, a leading defense aerospace technology company, we work closely with governments around the world to solve their most challenging security problems. And what we have found is if we really want the best solutions, we need to have a diverse 
set of opinions and backgrounds around the table. Um, so we've driven that throughout our entire corporation, throughout our, our entire culture. Um, much of this uh, we get from working with our U.S. government colleagues um, and the, the direction that they have given, um, going back many years to um, uh, requirements for working with small disadvantaged businesses and women-owned businesses. Um, we have watched our customer character and demographic change. So as women rise up in the government ranks, um, that is our major customer, and we correspond and try to be ahead of that. So we're reflecting, um, and if, if not keeping pace, maybe staying ahead of where the government is going. So, I, it, you know, if you look back to 2013, um, what happened in Japan when Prime Minister Shinzo Abe unveiled his Womenomics initiative. Um, he was very clear that if Japan was going to maintain its economic growth potential, they had to have more than 50% of their population, 50% of their brain power um, into the workforce. So they worked on getting rid of the barriers that working mothers often face going into the workplace, things like childcare, um, flexible hours, and they did see an economic um, benefit to that. So that's, that's how we see that, um, at least in my industry and in my company, and I'd be happy to talk a little bit more in the next phase about what we're specifically doing. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, and uh, let's continue, I would say, with Hans Christian. Uh, everyone, everyone's looking to Sweden uh, when the word feminist foreign policy is mentioned. It was, I think, a, a good move uh, to be, you know, really uh, uh, one, of the, one of the pioneers uh, in, this, in this area. But really, I mean, uh, it's true also in Berlin, if we have uh, uh, discussions on the topic, they often take place in the Swedish embassy and you, your, your government has been really supportive to also uh, advocacy organizations in this space. Um, Nancy just talked about, you know, uh, diversity just bringing better results. What was, what was your rationale uh, in your gov what was the rationale in your government for a feminist foreign policy? And I think the question everyone's interested in, how did you pull it off? Sure, um, thank you very much and good afternoon to you all. Uh, I'm honored to be here, this is uh, great fun. Uh, I happened to mention it to my uh, oldest daughter who's just finishing medical school and was kind enough to visit us uh, in, in my t hometown. And I mentioned that I was on this panel and she said, Dad, what do you know about women? <laughs> so it's a fair point, uh, but we've had a feminist foreign policy in Sweden since 2014 and this is not just one policy. It is perhaps the major foreign policy uh, in, in Sweden. And if I may share some of the thoughts how we define and see uh, feminist foreign policy. Uh, I would have started initially by plugging uh, Ambika's uh, excellent report from the Konrad Adenauer. And if you haven't read it, do read it. And there's some good stuff also from the ORF uh, speaking of uh, and uh, pushing uh, feminist foreign policy in an Indian context. I can highly recommend that. And even Minister Jashankar has spoken of, quote, bringing in a feminist perspective to foreign policy. So it's all about inclusion and diversity. And from Sweden, the motivation, which you asked me about, it's all about fairness and output. It is an objective in itself. We seek for women and girls to fully enjoy the human rights, all human rights. And we don't have to go much further than Universal Declaration of Human Rights or uh, the, the, the UN Charter. It's equality of women and men. That is the very core. And equality is equality. And in the Swedish definition, that is absolute. It is not 60-40. It's not 51-49. Uh, it is 50-50. It is equal rights for women uh, men, boys, and girls. And we also think it's smart to maximize the whole of the population. We believe in Sweden that more women in foreign policy and the empowerment of women delivers economic development, 
delivers more security, it delivers more democracy, it delivers more stability, and it does deliver more sustainability. So how do we achieve this? For us, it's three pillars. Nancy spoke about leadership, and that is the first one. It's representation. Leadership where it matters, where decisions are made. It is both in the political realm, in the economic realm, and not least in the business realm. Business is super important. All levels, from big business to private individual uh, businessmen, businesswomen. I can just mention that uh, in Sweden, 48% of our ambassadors are women. Among the heads of departments in the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 54% are women. In the Prime Minister's office, 60% are women. The Minister of Finance, in the Ministry of Finance, it's 56%. Ministry of Defense is not all male, it's 51% women. And among the ministers in government, more than half are women. And in the parliament, it's 46% uh, women. It hasn't always been that. Just going back 40, 50 years, 1970, it was just 13% women in the Swedish parliament. About the same number of women which the Indian Senate had. So we all started from a pretty bad level, and we just had four uh, members of parliament uh, who were female back, well, 100 years ago, back in 1921. Uh, uh, the second one, apart from representation is the rights. It's equality in access to education, work and pay, inheritance law, marriage, divorce, um, capital access. Do you have to ask permission from your husband to open a bank account? Um, financial independence and the right to your own body. Those are the rights. The third one is the resources. Where is the money and who decides about the money? development aid budgets, trade budgets, domestic budgets. Who is in that discussion and who is taking those decisions? And what are the biases? What are the discrimination elements of that? If you're part and if you have control of the money, it becomes more fair and you get better output. So let me st start uh, with that. Thank you very much, Hans Christian, and very much appreciated in, in the spirit of inclusivity, you know, to also have a, have a male voice on the panel. Uh, you know, because when you say leadership, the reality is of many organizations, it is still uh, male-led, and we cannot wait for the women to be in those positions to, to start implementing the measures you talked about. Um, I would continue with Dora. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Um, we, we have established uh, already that, you know, the thought of inclusivity and, and a feminist foreign policy goes uh, also way beyond just having a few women at the table. And, and I would be curious from, from your experience, uh, how, how do you see that in your work? What is really the value of a feminist foreign policy? Sure. Um, thank you, Sarah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. I have to say that I'm, uh, we were talking about inclusivity, and I'm here um, from, from Hungary with the three amazing ladies sitting over there. So I think that the gender balance is not perfect uh, with our delegation, but we're very happy to be here. Um, I would like to share a slightly different perspective on, um, on feminist foreign policy, and I would like to speak a little bit, little bit about my experience when it comes to the Hungarian foreign policy and what I experienced, because before joining my organization, I used to work in the Hungarian Foreign Service. And um, I have to say that overall, I think that the situation is, is, is pretty good. A few weeks ago, um, the, the new president of Hungary was elected, who's a lady. She used to work in the Foreign Service, and um, she then became the, the Minister for Youth and Family Affairs. Um, she's e extremely active, internationally speaking, so I think that um, uh, sh she will continue this work. When it comes to the foreign ministry, um, there are quite a few ministerial commissioners who are responsible for quite important topics, for example, space research or energy policy, and they are all led um, uh, by, by, by female leaders. And um, when it comes to ambassadors, I think we are pretty good on that front as well. Uh, we have actually, just looking at the, the region, we have Hungarian um, female ambassadors in, in the Philippines, in Malaysia, in Singapore, um, and a couple of other countries as well. Um, in my experience, there are three main ways how we can encourage women to, to participate more in, in foreign policy, and foreign politics, and, um, and, and politics in general. 
Uh, the first one is, of course, uh, focusing on the system and making sure that they have equal access to, um, to studying, learning, and other opportunities, um, equal um, uh, as men. The second one is basically encouraging women, um, which is something that we're doing at our organization as well, to speak up a little bit more, to be a little bit more assertive when needed, and so on and so forth. And the third thing, which is, I think, a reality and something that is quite important, is uh, making sure that we take off some of the burden when it comes to, to, to family life um, uh, from, from women, because I think this is a problem and this is something that we, we have to talk about. And in that regard, I think that there have been um, some initi in initiatives uh, coming from the Hungarian government and other um, actors, and I think that they've been quite successful. Um, they started in 2010, and um, uh, basically Hungary is spending 6% of their GDP on supporting women and, and family uh, policy. Um, I think that the average is around, in terms of the OECD countries, I think it's around 2%, 2.3%. Um, so I think it has been a, a huge development um, uh, ever since. And we can see the results of that. I wouldn't like to go uh, into much details, maybe later on. Um, and then just one thing, one a little slightly provocative thing, if, uh, if you allow me uh, to say, is that I think that if we ensure that women have equal um, access to education and other opportunities, and um, if we provide all the financial support as well, coming from the government or other actors, um, in order to make sure that they can uh, basically juggle better the, the, their career and, uh, um, and the family life, I think that it, it still might happen that just in, in certain professions, there will not be 50%, 50% when it comes to uh, men and women, and I think it, uh, it, it can be fine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dora. And I think on the connection between the foreign policy and, and the domestic and, and even, you know, uh, uh, gender equality in homes, this is something we can also touch upon maybe in, in the second round, how that uh, would be relevant to make sure uh, feminism can be realized. Um, I will, last year on the panel for the first round, um, ask Alexandra for, for her contribution and then I will do something and invite my co-panelists uh, to take up the challenge with me to already take questions from the audience and weave that into the second round because I think otherwise we'll not have that much time uh, to hear from all of you. So we will hear, our, hear Alexandra and, and you feel free to, to prepare your, your questions already. Um, and then I will call up on a few people and, and we'll weave that into the second round. Alexandra, you're um, the representative for, for Women, Peace and Security for the Middle East at uh, UN Women an organization obviously at, at the forefront uh, of working for gender equality and the needs of, of women and girls. And uh, you know, I'd be curious you, your perspective uh, when you hear the different countries, uh, uh, you know, talking about a feminist foreign policy, what it means to them, but also at the same time in your work, really seeing what are the needs on on the ground in conflict contexts. Um, um, you know, it's a really big chance to have, uh, you know, governments with a lot of funding uh, embracing this, but also there are, there are pitfalls. So, so we'll be really really curious to hear uh, your perspective. Great, thank you so much, Sarah, um, and good afternoon to everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here with my co-panelists and with all of you and uh, in person, which is uh, really nice to, to be able to do that again. Um, so I think um, in, in terms of uh, feminist foreign policy and, and how we define it, uh, I think, uh, Sarah, you, you rightly sort of alluded to this fact that, you know, it has become a buzzword, it, it has become an increasingly uh, popular uh, term, at least in certain circles. Um, and uh, there, are, uh, there are both opportunities, opportunities and challenges associated with a term uh, becoming this kind of buzzword. So I want to um, reflect maybe on, on three aspects uh, that I see as, um, as challenges in terms of how we actually define uh, what a feminist foreign policy truly is. Um, and the first point um, that I want to highlight is that it is both about process and about outcome uh, or substance. And I think that currently the discussion is very much skewed towards the process side of things. We talk a lot about the issue of, of participation and how to make participation in policy making more inclusive. Now that is of course crucial. We do want to bring a diversity of voices to the table. Um, but that is only one part of the equation. And I will talk a little bit more about some of the more substantive aspects in, in a moment. But just on inclusion, I do want to echo uh, some of the points that have already been made um, and emphasize that uh, inclusion has to mean 
and is intended to mean in a, in a feminist sense, um, that it is not only the inclusion of or a greater diversity of those doing the policy, but it's also bringing in the voices of those at the receiving end of that policy. And I think that that is something where we still have quite a bit of work to do. Um, and so hearing the perspectives of those who are affected by the policy that we are, that we are making and, and implementing. Um, in addition to the points that, that were already made around sort of that uh, inclusion being uh, an intersectional inclusion, uh, and so not just focusing on issues of gender, but also uh, of uh, issues of um, ethnic, racial, or religious background, socioeconomic background, age, disability, uh, an intersectional feminist approach to, to inclusion, I think, is, um, is key. Um, but then moving on from, from sort of that uh, uh, participation lens, to then some of the, the content of the policy itself and the issues that a feminist foreign policy needs to engage with. I think the first one uh, is picking up on, on this issue of um, feminist foreign policy not just being a Western-centric concept, but again, not just from the perspective of participation, but also in terms of thinking actively about, from a feminist perspective, what should be the relationship of the West with the rest of the world. Uh, it is one of the most, um, I think my, one of the most prominent issues and questions in international relations today. We've seen throughout the three days of this conference, it's been a recurring theme, questions around how should the West or the global North, if you prefer, engage with other parts of the world? Through what means? Uh, what is the future of the multilateral system? What is the future of the liberal international order and the place of the West within that and that of other rising powers and, and, and others? Um, feminism, with its very rich intellectual history, has a lot to say about these issues. There are strong traditions of anti-colonialist and anti-imperialist thought, uh, there are uh, other considerations coming out of that intellectual tradition of feminism that should be part of this discussion and they should be related to some of these contemporary questions that we have about some of these very key issues. And so I think that we need to think about feminist foreign policy not sort of in isolation from some of these very central debates about the state of international affairs today. Um, then the third point is um, sort of uh, follows from that looking at the actual implementation of feminist foreign policy. So what does it mean in practice and sort of moving beyond this issue of a, of a buzzword of a, uh, or a slogan, what does it mean in concrete action? Um, and I think there are two challenges that we are seeing in, in this regard. One is to kind of spell out more concretely what a feminist approach can mean in different situations. Um, we've seen sort of very, um, I would say, generic or, or sort of um, a focus on, on sort of certain key principles, of course, that a feminist foreign policy should adhere to in terms of a more human security focused approach versus a, a, a militarized approach, uh, issues around human rights and women's rights that, that Hans Christian referred to. Um, but beyond that, more specifically, more concretely, what does this mean when we are confronted with the situation in Ukraine? When we are thinking about nuclear negotiations with Iran, when we are looking at the situation in Syria, when we are looking at the situation in Afghanistan, what does it mean in these situations to apply a feminist lens beyond the issue of focusing on women's rights more narrowly, right? Um, and I think that in practice what we have seen is that um, the countries uh, that have espoused um, a feminist foreign policy, at least in rhetoric, um, I think there has been some very legitimate criticism that this does not necessarily translate into tangible action, that there have been some questionable practices around how these countries continue to support authoritarian regimes, sell arms to regimes that clearly violate human rights and women's rights in particular, uh, and many other of these sort of uh, contradictions that have, been, that have been pointed out. But so again, I sort of pose the question of like, okay, but tell me what it means for your government if you say you have espoused a feminist foreign policy, how has that changed your approach to 
the situation in, country X or Y, the many concrete foreign policy challenges that we are be dealing with uh, in today's world. And I think that for me is sort of a, the decisive kind of moment to sort of to see whether this, this concept of a feminist foreign policy actually has any teeth or whether it is just a sort of nice rhetorical slogan that we sort of subscribe to because it seems politically correct. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Uh, really, really important to emphasize, you know, that as with many, many other value-loaded policies and concepts, it's a, it's a spectrum, right? It always sounds great, but it's really about what, what's really behind, behind uh, uh, the concept. Um, I would now, uh, as I said, uh, take a few questions already from the audience, uh, and I can see a uh, hand. The second table was first, so let's take uh, the two ladies at that table. Alex, I work in the U.S. Congress. Um, I'd love to hear from the panelists about prospects for the U.S. government to pursue a more feminist foreign policy or actually mainstream the WPS agenda when our budgets are so heavily tilted towards defense in the Pentagon at the expense of diplomacy and development and those investments that the WPS agenda suggests are important for a more sustainable national security agenda. And for Nancy in particular, uh, it's great to see a woman in a powerful national security position in the U.S. industry, but I'd love to hear how Lockheed actually lobbies on behalf of the WPS agenda, if you do, and whether you ever consider using Lockheed's very powerful, very influential lobbying to advance um, the WPS goals, and perhaps consider uh, advocating for more robust ASVOPS budget at the expense of the Pentagon. Good afternoon, my name is Randy Gebert. I'm a policy officer at NATO and I have two uh, country-specific questions. One uh, refers to the study you presented on India and I'd be quite interested to hear more about the um, political discourse amongst the political leadership uh, in India about the concept of a feminist foreign policy. Is this actually a thing that is actively being discussed at the moment? Uh, and then secondly, on the question, uh, on the concept of a feminist foreign policy and whether it has teeth and what it means, I'm thinking about uh, the German government where in the coalition, uh, the new coalition government has aspired to uh, implement a feminist foreign policy and quite frankly, I did not have the impression that much has changed in the uh, German foreign policy, at least when it comes to a, a feminist perspective. So I would be interested to hear the panel's uh, take on that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for those excellent questions. Um, let's take those two and I would, I would give it to Ambika. There was a question uh, on India and then afterwards also uh, to Nancy on, on the US. Uh, we can uh, keep in mind, the rest of you can keep in mind if you want to say something in direction of, of Germany as well later maybe and we'll take more questions. Ambika, so there was a specific question uh, on the next steps for India, uh, which you touch on also in your report. Uh, but I know, I mean, your intellectual thinking about this topic also goes way beyond, right? What is, what is in this um, inception uh, kind of report of the project? So if you want to react to, to any of the other statements, like, ooh, like what Alexandra said in, in the end, uh, you know, how to also make the discussion about the policy more inclusive and uh, what, what, what you would want to, to see uh, move ahead. And, you know, everyone in the audience can maybe be uh, uh, an ally for that going forward. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Actually, uh, I just wanted to a little bit touch upon what Alexandra also said. I mean, this is absolutely the question we asked right up front. Um, what does this mean for a country uh, that Sweden or Germany or Canada might want to do when they're implementing a policy in, a, in another country? So in India, for example, how does your feminist trade policy or how does your feminist international assistant assistance policy or uh, your feminist climate policy benefit the partners that you're working with? So that is a question we did ask. Uh, we've gotten a lot of good feedback as to how this is actually operationalized. Um, I won't go into all of that because then we'll need to be sitting here all day. But, uh, but there is a lot of research out on how this is done specifically. And the one thing that we have been trying to put forth to um, many of these countries is that when you design this specific kind of um, broader policy making system, you need to bring the other countries into that conversation as well. So it cannot be a feminist foreign policy from Sweden or even from India at some maybe some years down the line towards another country. 
not having brought that country or that region into that discourse right from the get-go. So, so I'm, I'm really glad that Alexandra brought that up. Um, with the US having a, a feminist foreign policy, uh, there's a lot of excellent research that's been done by the ICRW. So I will point you to that research. They're, they're looking into this. They're creating a coalition as to how this might be operationalized in an American context. I will not speak for them, but I would say uh, suggest you to look into uh, some of their excellent research that they've brought out. Um, as to the political discourse in India, uh, it's very nascent, uh, to, be, to be very honest, uh, but it's there. It's in small pockets for sure. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've spoken to over almost 100 people within the whole foreign policy making ecosystem. Uh, and that's not just people in the uh, ministry itself, but from the, the surrounding. So former diplomats, people who are the think tanks, uh, the academics, historians, and uh, uh, the diplomatic core over here that might be involved in creating some sort of system like this in India going forward. We're also talking to people in the region as to what they want to see. So um, I don't have a, uh, an answer just yet for you, but I'm hoping by the end of this year, we'll have a lot more research on this uh, ready. But it, it is heartening to know that uh, the discourse is happening in India. Uh, the foreign minister himself, a couple, I think it was last year, in an interview said uh, that there were good parts about having a feminist foreign policy and that it was required. Um, and so there is some sort of um, positivity coming out of the ministry in that sense. Uh, and there's a lot of interest in India now to see where this could go. Uh, and through our research, and you'll see in our report, we found a lot of evidence of good gender mainstreaming in many areas of our foreign policy already. So we're trying to unpack what that means and how it can be structured in a better format and then sort of be operationalized in other areas of our foreign policy making that might not have had a gender lens yet. So uh, maybe by the end of the year, I'll be able to give you something a little bit more concrete. Excellent. And okay. uh, Nancy, I think you have your, your work carved out yes. on the innovative, uh, you know, maybe role of yeah, the private Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you for the question. Um, so I, I spent many years lobbying uh, Capitol Hill. And with Lockheed Martin, I've been involved for many years with uh, the U.S. Global Leadership Campaign, um, which lobbies the Hill for a robust international affairs budget. Um, we see stability as being crucial for security around the world. Um, security has many aspects, conventional security, energy security, water security, food security. These are all issues that affect the stability um, and, and sustainability of good governance around the world. Uh, the, the three tenants that we see, the three stools, the three legs of the stool um, for that are include defense, but also to include development and uh, diplomacy. So when you ask about lobbying, we do, we do lobby for all of those three elements because they need to work together um, to, to provide uh, global security and uh, prosperity, economic growth, um, and peace. So thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, use the remaining time that we have to take a few more questions. Um, I see one over there. I saw one over here uh, as well. So those two. Yeah, hi. My name is uh, Lukas Lamberti. I work at Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Berlin. So uh, let me first use this opportunity to express our gratitude. We're very happy to be on board to support this publication. I actually have a question to Hans Christian. Um, so this outward dimension of feminist foreign policy that uh, you, Alexandra, mentioned, I would be very interested to hear some examples uh, and some measures that you, you implemented. Um, and specifically maybe one point, because uh, I learned that Sweden recently reintroduced conscription also for women. Um, and I would be very interested to hear how this also fits in the equation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Noemi Palfavi from Hungary. Thank you for the opportunity. And I do want to highlight before I ask my questions that I think this is uh, going to be very country specific. So I'm, I cannot wait to read, for example, the report. But where I come from and, and in the region, um, I think it's a very big problem that in a, I, that in a lot of cases, 
um, women say that, okay, I was discriminated because I'm a woman, so I didn't get this just because I'm a woman. And I don't think that sometimes they evaluate the problem um, in a little bit broader sense. And my first question is like, do you think this is a real problem in the regions where you are working? And second, what do you think, how can we help women, and especially younger women and younger generation, to be able to make an ex the distinction between when you're actually being discriminized or then when you are just simply not uh, fitting in the, the criteria, for example, the, the job listing or things like that? Thank you. Thank you. And I think we can take a third question from the second table that was there. Thank you for all the panelists. Uh, actually, my question will be more um, related to the East Asian part of the world because uh, in South Korea, for instance, in the recent elections, the opposition parties and I mean, the liberals and the conservatives actually, uh, interestingly, like met in a, in a common uh, point, which was uh, actually their anti-feminist stance, and they were very busy with uh, like saying that we will shut down the uh, the Minister of Gender and Family, uh, Gender Equality and Family, etc. So in this sense, all the I mean, South Korea has like a years ago has a had a uh, female president and also had a female foreign minister. Uh, but we still see that at the domestic level and the, at the societal level, uh, the feminism and anti-feminism is one of the important discussions in South Korea. So uh, can we think of a kind of um, feminist foreign policy which is independent from the domestic structures or domestic issues? So in this sense, uh, can we see kind of like more opportunity to, to see in more countries like at the societal level they are supporting the feminism so that it, 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 it is more possible to see uh, they are following a feminist foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you very much for those, those excellent questions. Um, Hans Christian, there was one question specifically to you on, on concrete measures and um, what I also wanted to play back to you was maybe the, the question on uh, is it possible to have a feminist foreign policy without the domestic element to it? Like, do you think that is possible and how do you navigate it? Um, well, thank you very much, Sarah. I think just to start with that one, I think it's difficult to have a foreign policy which, is, which doesn't correlate with your own national policies. Uh, you have to believe in your own policy. You have, you have to prove what works. You have to make an argument. You have to invest in, in your own policy, in your own country. That is the ultimate investment uh, of it all. Um, I mean, the Swedish feminist por foreign policy is about correcting injustices. It is correcting inequality. Uh, it is to protect and defend women and girls. It is also to invest in the long term. Uh, and we're keenly aware that all societies are different, different traditions, different values, uh, and so forth. But for us, for example, when we look is very intimately linked to climate change. That we see that women will be disproportionately impacted by climate change. In large parts of the world, women do much of the uh, food collection, water management, a lot of the, the uh, family welfare uh, elements of it all. Uh, and when we will have extra strains on the environment and dramatic he heat waves, more dramatic storms uh, and, and weather, it will be women who will be most impacted. So that is a very important part in the Swedish feminist foreign policy, try to target those who are the most vulnerable and try to invest in them so they're better prepared uh, for the future. Uh, and it is a fact that women have poorer safety nets than men uh, and job security and so forth. Uh, there is a lag there. We saw during COVID that domestic violence peaked, uh, I shouldn't say peaked maybe in historical terms, but it was a sharp rise, which very, very much concerned us. And this is an issue which is mentioned at the top level of Swedish government, both internally uh, in all ministries, but especially in the feminist foreign policy. What can we do to help to alleviate that? Women in conflict resolution. Yes, women need to be part, speaking of uh, being part of who we are communicating to, they have to be part of the solution. And we do believe that as soon as we talk about health issues, as soon as we talk about conflict resolution, as soon as we talk about peacekeeping, women need to be at the table and they need to be involved and need to buy into this policy as well. Just as it is important that men are buying into the feminist foreign policy, 
it's, this is not just a conversation uh, among half the population. Everybody has to buy into it and see the advantages, see the cost benefits of this. And if one wants to be really crass, this is about money and output as well. We need to maximize, especially I come from a very small country with a small economy, we need to maximize everything, innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, engagement, and everybody needs to pull their weight. Everybody needs to contribute. Uh, there is a slight challenge to this because the Swedish model is based on dual income families. We speak very highly of childcare. There needs to be support systems. The importance of transparent uh, salaries, for example, that everybody knows what everybody else is, uh, is making and what criteria they are following so you can follow up if your colleague is making more or less than you are in relation to what you're putting into the job. So the transparency, the engagement, the equality of tax systems and all this, is, these are important elements. They take years and maybe decades to implement, but steadily, steadily uh, of the, the economic issues, I come back to that, that economic independence, both nationally but also internationally, is something which I believe will create more stability, more sustainability, and it will lead to more peace. Sorry, this is not kumbaya. This is more sustainable, more long-term peace if women are involved. State of fact. Thank you, Hans Christian. And I think the research on this uh, so far is, is pretty clear with like how long, for example, um, peace agreements last when, when women were, were at the table. And I'm, I'm happy that you also took up the resource part, right? Because we talked about representation, we talked about rights, and this uh, emerging formula 3R plus D, like rights, uh, representation and resources plus the diversity aspect. The resources is not to, to you know, the safety net aspect you mentioned that, you know, it, it makes a difference whether women can have land rights in a country, for example, right? Whether we, they are allowed to inherit land and property or whether that is always dependent on a male counterpart. Aspects like that, um, attracting funding even for innovation, for venture capital funding to women-led organizations is, is much lower than for men-led organizations. Um, let me um, take a, a, another response from Dora as well. Um, uh, when you hear also the resource aspect of it, I, I remember in the first round you mentioned this tension between making sure that women can be 50-50 represented, but also you, you, know, you framed it as have to you know, pull it off in, in terms of commitments, child care commitments that, that Hans Christian also talked upon. Um, how do you see that in, in, in your work? Is, is that kind of uh, re equal division of tasks in the workplace and at home, something that you have in your debate and, and you wanted to touch also upon your work with the new generation in the college, right? Are these uh, kind of discussions you, you have where you're maybe hopeful that the new, the new generation approaches this a bit differently? Sure, uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, actually, I would like to uh, circle back to uh, Hans Christian's uh, point because I think it was very important what he said that I think feminism and the situation of women is clearly very much um, uh, country specific and, and context specific because I think culture and history really matters. And then when it comes to 50 50, um, m some people say that um, basically, like the single income model uh, stopped existing in the Western world like around the 1980s. And what I'd like to share is that in Hungary, and I'm sorry, may I ask, um, is there anybody else from Central Eastern Europe other than my Hungarian friends? Uh, which country? Okay. Uh, so I think that it was uh, uh, quite similar to, uh, in, in all these countries that the single income model uh, uh, stopped existing in 1945, basically, so after the World Wars. And after that, all women had to go to work and had to, uh, and, and work basically throughout the 20th century. And in addition to that, of course, like they also had to take care of the, uh, of the children and the family. I do think that in both aspects, there are things to do. And of course, like there are things that we can do um, in order to provide more help uh, to women. Uh, one aspect is, of course, the, um, the, the, the family policy, what I've mentioned, so I think that the government has, uh, has a, a huge role in that. Um, but I think that we just come from a very uh, uh, different uh, understanding of, um, of, of female roles and what, what women did. And I remember when I was 18 or 19, I heard about feminism for the first time, to, to be honest. I think I was actually studying in Paris and then uh, 
more and more people were talking about it than in, than in Hungary. And then I felt, okay, uh, this is uh, also awful, and I think a, a little bit related to Noemi's question, um, I felt that I'm a victim of, of some sort of um, a system, and then there's something that I have to do. But then I started thinking about my family, my mother, my grandmother, and like other examples that I saw, and I just realized that basically everybody worked, and not only my family. This was just a, um, a, a national thing that they had to. Um, and so I think that um, I take an issue with, with feminism sometimes in the sense that I, I think it's a, a little bit ignorant about the, uh, about the historical and cultural differences um, uh, when it comes to different uh, countries. Um, I do think that the new generation is quite concerned about that, and I think everybody is concerned about that, but um, as I imagine, I think it's not really that, okay, you strike the perfect balance and then everything is great from that, but I think that this is something, this is a challenge that we have to face every day, and I think that it's a bit of a dynamic challenge. So sometimes you, mm-hmm. uh, you do more on your work front, and other times you, you do a little bit more on your, on your personal front, and then um, uh, try to solve the situations day by day. Thank you very much. Um, Alexandra, you, you and your work probably are also confronted with different contexts, right? Different cultural contexts with different conceptions of feminism, different family models, different uh, situations of, of women, both in the workplace and at home. And, and I would be curious, uh, what, is, what is your thought about striking this balance? I mean, we also had a question on, you know, um, uh, when is it discrimination, when is it not, um, and, and how generally to drive this empowerment agenda forward in an inclusive way, but also in a way that you know rallies as many po- people as possible on board um, with it. Right, um, thanks. Uh, well, I think this last point is really the crucial one in terms of you know, how do you uh, bring as many allies into this conversation as, as possible, and I think When it comes to um, uh, some of those debates about how to increase women's participation in foreign policy or in in peace processes more widely, I mean, in in the context where I work, it's it's a lot about about that in terms of how to include women in conflict resolution and peace building efforts and so forth. And um, the approach that is being taken predominantly is an extremely narrow one because it's one that continues to focus on basically uh, uh, fixing the women, like as if the women were the problem, right? So it's, it's constantly about like, well, how can we build women's capacity? How can we train them? Uh, nobody ever talks about the need to train the men. Uh, it's uh, apparently they are born with a perfect skill set already. Uh, it does not exactly translate into foreign policy successes, I may say, but uh, uh, still somehow, uh, somehow we only need to train the women. Um, it's a very, um, not only a kind of a gender bias, but also a very supply-driven model of thinking about uh, how to invest in, uh, in gender equality because it's very easy to provide training. We have uh, a whole array of institutions that can, that can do that. Uh, we get funding for it. We can very easily tick the box of, well, we have trained so and so many women, so, so now we've done our part, right? Um, so it's a very limited, uh, a very limited model, and I do think that, that this aspect about thinking about how you um, how you conscript allies and bring allies into into this, um, so uh, uh, men and and others, of course, uh, in terms of uh, bringing them into the conversation and asking what they can do uh, to support a more inclusive foreign policy or peace process or whatever the context might be, what they can do um, to contribute to striking down barriers to to greater uh, inclusion. Um, And I think then, uh, beyond that, to also not make this just about individuals, um, because ultimately we are dealing with with a system where there are structural barriers to, to inclusion. And so we need to be talking also about the Uh, even more complex and difficult issue of of how do we actually change some of these existing structures and institutions. And we see this very clearly, I mean, in in my work um, in the Middle East, working on various peace processes that are not going anywhere, unfortunately, one of the questions that that we are asking is how can we think differently about how we design these processes from the outset, rather than always doing the same thing bringing on board always the same types of actors who are predominantly male, who are the conflict parties, so it's the ones sort of who are at the source of the problem, (laughs) right? And then 
uh, we see, well, but then it's not sufficiently in, uh, inclusive, so how can we now sort of post facto bring in other groups, and women in particular, and it's challenging because then they don't get a seat at the table and so forth. So we're really trying to sort of move the conversation beyond just you know adding chairs to the table, but actually rethinking the table and, and how it's set, right? Um, and, and so I think that that is really uh, something that we need more of, to ask the more fundamental questions and not to put the onus on women themselves and, and on individuals more widely. Uh, so, some of those, so some of those very tough, uh, uh, more structural, more institutional questions. Thank you very much. And I think with this one, um, it also becomes clear that there is very much uh, you know, a link between the topic we are discussing and all the other sessions at this conference, right? Because we talk about global order, we glo gl talk about co uh, cooperation and relationships between different countries, we, we talk about hierarchies in the international system, um, who gets to, gets, to, gets to make the foreign policy, and the transformative aspect, like how to make sure uh, that really, you know, as I said in the beginning, it's not just an exercise of ticking boxes, of having a few women on a, on a delegation ticket, uh, of having a few seats, and also, you know, appreciating what you said, uh, maybe next year we will have, a, I said, men peace and security, or masculinity peace and security panel as well, uh, or even weave, uh, you know, even more uh, these topics into the conversations on on the other topics uh, as well, you know? And for that, having women represented at the table is one way to do that, but it's obviously also not, you know, a, a, a sufficient condition, um, you know, in, in a way. Nancy, you would like to say something? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to make a, 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 a comment um, reinforcing what, what I think I've heard, and that is um, innovation. So, as a technology company, as I said, bringing uh, diverse groups around the table, looking at complex problems in a new way, you do need that, that broader perspective. Um, and the way we're training and looking for the next generation of innovators is uh, focusing on girls, focusing on STEM education um, as a key element, uh, we're doing quite a lot here in India, both with Women in Aviation, which is a great organization, um, and adopting schools that support um, underserved communities, focus on STEM education. But it's not just STEM, it's teaching young women to be leaders so that they can grow up with the confidence to know that they have value and they don't wait for a seat at the table, but they expect and demand a seat at the table. So, thank you. Thank you. I, I see two minutes 40 on our clock, so, so if any one of you has, has any, yeah. Uh, thank you. Just to add on to um, what Alexandra and Nancy said, uh, it's, it's absolutely about agency. Uh, you can have any number of women um, at, a, at a table, at a conversation, but if they don't have the agency to implement what needs to be done, then it's just numbers. Uh, and so that comes back then to creating structural and systemic change. And that's not only on the women at all, it's on everybody. Um, it's on the men, it's on the women, it's on uh, people of other genders, it's on different communities, different ethnic groups, uh, socioeconomic groups, uh, poor people, rich people, however you want to look at it, right? And uh, that's, that's the only way any of this is actually going to make a difference. And that's something we, I, I'm completely plugging in my report again over here, uh, but we talk about that, uh, the need for this systemic and structural change. Uh, because if you don't, that, that's the only way from the bottom up, if you ensure that everybody has that same agency, then you, can, you will have the feminist men and the feminist women. Um, and I think ev all the women here can agree that you can have women who are not feminists, uh, and you will absolutely have men who are feminists, right? So everybody needs to have that, that level agency playing field and a system that allows them to do so. And this is not just only in foreign policy, but in all kinds of foreign po policy making in a government, but in your businesses as well, um, and in other forms of governance that we are seeing. Uh, so just wanted to 
Last Thank end you. with that. Excellent. And I mean, while it is, you know, it may be uh, some EU countries, but also non-EU countries at the forefront of, of devising feminist foreign policies, we would not have this rich history and intellectual history of feminism without, you know, feminists of color who were really at the basis of this, who started a movement, uh, you know, have a critical lens and a tr transformative perspective on gender and, and related issues and uh, intersectionality. So on this note, uh, uh, do uh, definitely grab a cof uh, copy of the report. Uh, thank you very, very much for joining us. Thanks to all the panelists for sharing their perspectives and uh, a round of applause for this excellent panel. Thank you.